Income tax 2022-2023. Other income part number two. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from the Form 1040 Tax Year 2022 instructions. Instructions for Schedule 1, Additional Income, and Adjustments to Income. You can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Remembering, support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it that when we're looking at our income tax formula, we're focused on line one being income. Noting the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement, although a strange one. Income minus the equivalent of the expenses being deductions gives us the equivalent of net income, or in this case, taxable income. The objective being flipped on its head in that we want the taxable income as low as possible, as opposed to typically in a normal income statement where we want net income as high as possible. That means when we're focused on line one, as we are here, we need to determine if something is indeed income. And if so, is it something that we can ha possibly have an exemption to so that we don't have to include it in income for taxes? We're focused down here on line number eight of the form 1040 other income from schedule one. And on schedule one, we're focused down at the bottom these line eight with the other income. We did like half of them last time. We're gonna continue on to some of these more other income categories. Remembering that these are more of the kind of random stuff, that stuff that you probably, you know, obviously it doesn't have a, a line item in somewhere else on the tax return, but because all things are income, unless the IRS says otherwise, you can have a bunch of random scenarios where you might have income down here. So line, uh, line eight in section 951A, uh, inclusion. So you got section 951 generally requires a U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation include in income its pro rata share of the corporation's subpart F income and its amount determined under section 956. Enter on line 8N uh, from your form 5471 the sum of any amounts reported on schedule I lines 1A through H and line two, remember to attach copies of your form 5471 to your return. So obviously this would be one of those kind of items that is not gonna be normal for depending on the type of clients that you have. It points out once again, the idea that when you're picking up possibly doing clients, doing tax returns for multiple people, you might want to determine where your specialization is. One of those specializations might be, do I want to work on people that have one place or location? such as the, the state and or uh, the country. And then if you have multiple you know, locations in multiple different countries, that usually is gonna add levels of complexity. And then what's the income level of the tax returns that I'm going to be dealing with? Lower income levels are less likely to have you know, a, a situation such as this. Higher income levels are possibly more likely to have a situation like this. And then of course, the type of entities that you want to be dealing with. You want to be dealing with mainly uh, individual income tax returns or business tax returns or a combination of the two possibly also specializing by industry okay line a o oh, section 951a uh, a inclusion section 951 generally requires a u.s shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation include in income as global uh, intangible low taxed income, that's the G-I-L-T-I. -I. Enter on line 80 uh, from your forms 8992, the sum of any amounts reported on part two, line five. Remember to attach copies of your forms 8992. Caution, if you made a section 962 election and have an income inclusion under section 951 or 951A, do not report that income on line 8N or 8O as applicable. Uh, instead, 
report the tax with uh, with respect to the Section 962 election on Form 1040 or 1040 SR Line 16 and attach a statement showing how you figured the tax that includes the gross amounts of Section 951 and Section uh, 951A income. All right, then we've got Line 8P. We got the 461i excess business loss adjustment into the amount of your excess business loss from form uh, 461 line 16. So this is going to take into consideration again a, what you might consider more of a specialized T area where you have the business component to the taxation and relation to a business loss situation. Note again that when we have losses, that's where the IRS is typically going to be more skeptical. Very skeptical. Because the losses could actually be uh, a tax benefit. So if you have business income, then obviously the IRS is going to want a piece of it. If you have losses, the IRS generally doesn't want to be taking on the risk of the losses. So there's going to be possibly limitations in terms of how much losses is, you might be able to be taking. Line 8Q, taxable distributions from an ABLE, A-B-L-E account. Distributions from this type of account may be taxable if A, they are more than the designated beneficiary's qualified disability expenses and B, they are not included in a qualified rollover. So for more information, if you have the ABLE accounts, you can see publications 907 for more information. So just a general idea of an ABLE account, it would only be in, in a situation where a specialized situation, it's a, a tax advantaged savings account for individuals with disabilities. The general idea is kind of similar to an IRA. Most people have kind of a concept of an IRA, but with an IRA, you typically get a benefit when you put the money into the IRA, and then you also get the gains of the IRA often in the form of interest and dividends, which are then deferred in terms of the taxes that you're gonna be uh, pulling out at the end. So it's kind of more similar to like a Roth IRA type of situation where the benefit is that you could put the money into the account and then possibly not be taxed on the income of the account if you're using it in the way that the government wants you to use it. In the case of a basically an IRA or a Roth IRA, they want you to save for retirement. That's kind of the, the idea here. They want you to use the, the money for uh, the purposes of uh, disability savings. So if you use it for some other purpose, then you could be have an income triggering situation. And so if you set, if you had someone that set up an ABLE, then, then the idea is that you typically wouldn't have income related to it unless distributions from this type of account may be taxable if A, they are more than the designated beneficiary's qualified disability expenses because that's the reason that you get to take the money out of that type of account and not have to have the tax triggering event uh which which could be, be then the recognition your reaction one of recognition of the gains on the money that's been in the savings account possibly in the form of dividend dividends interest capital gains and so on and b they were not included in a qualified rollover so you have a similar kind of situation here. Now you have these investment tools, which are similar to investment tools. You might think of like an IRA or something in that they're not like new tools the government came up with. They're just, the government's just giving tax benefits on the tools. So you'd probably have the money into say stocks and bonds or something, savings account or something like that. And, and then uh, if you wanted to roll it over, roll over just like an IRA or something to another financial institution you don't want to count that as a draw you want to count that as a rollover uh, kind of situation if possible but uh, you might have a, a tax triggering event uh, in the event that you pull in the money out of the ABLE account so you got to be careful there so that's why it says B they were not included in a qualified rollover so if you have the ABLE you can look at publication 907 irs.gov irs.gov the IRS website caution you may have to pay an additional tax if you received a taxable distribution from an ABLE account so you could see the instructions for form 5329 so note that if you take advantage of some of these tax benefit types of savings uh, tools, IRAs, the the savings account, uh, the, the ABLE account, the Roth IRA and stuff, and then you don't do the thing that you kind of committed to do in order to get the tax benefit, then you could have added tax, which are in essence penalties. So line eight R scholarship and fellowship grants are not reported on uh, form W-2. 
scholarship and fellowship grants not reported on Form W-2. Now, this is kind of an issue with regards to the money that people are getting for higher education because the question is, well, is this something that I have to include in income now if I got money in order to be used for higher education? Now, obviously, if the money came from like through an employer or something like that, then the employer would be the one that would be responsible and they would have to report it if they need to report it. I need to write a report on uh, the form w-2 so if you got scholarship money that's not reported on the w-2 then the question is do you have to include it in like uh income so enter the amount of scholarship and fellowship grants not reported on form w-2 however if you were a degree candidate include online ar only of the amounts you used for expenses other than tuition and course related expenses for uh, example, amounts used for room, board, and travel must be reported on line 8R. So the idea here being is it depends on what you used the money for in order to see whether or not you have to include it in income. Remember the concept is if you have it included in income, that's basically bad, right? So we want something to be getting income, getting this money for scholarship and whatnot, and be able to exclude it from income. Now, the restrictions to do that, you might say, well, whatever I need to spend it on that's kind of school related, but it's a little bit more restricted than some other areas, possibly areas like uh, like credits, education credits, which we will get to uh, later. So you want to make sure that you're spending the money in an appropriate fashion to kind of maximize uh, your benefits from that source of income. So lines eight, uh, 8S, non-taxable amount of, me of Medicaid waiver payments included on form 1040 line 1A or 1D. So certain Medicaid waiver payments you receive for caring for someone living in, uh, in your home with you may be non-taxable. If non-taxable payments were reported to you in box one of forms W-2, report the amount on form 1040 or 1040 SR line 1A. That would be the primary account we probably first comes to mind or primary line first comes to mind when we're thinking about reporting income from the W-2s. So if you did not receive a form W-2 for non-taxable payments or you received non-taxable payments that you don't report on line 1A and choose to include non-taxable amounts in earned income for purposes of claiming a credit or other tax benefit, report the amount on form 1040 or 1040 SR line 1D. Now this is kind of that weird type of situation where normally if you had some kind of income the general idea is that it would be a benefit if you got to exclude it from income. So the idea would be, well, the, the government's gonna, gonna, the IRS is gonna say some types of income we're gonna give a benefit to, possibly more likely lower income people or people that they're trying to give an incentive to. So we're gonna say, we're not gonna force you to include this income as income, which should lower your taxes. However, we have these refundable credits now, the primary ones being the earned income credit and the child tax credits but t typically thinking about the earned income credit oftentimes, which has a refundable component to it. And the earned income credit actually goes up as you earn uh, more money. So up to a certain point, and then it goes back down again. The idea being a reasonable from an, one from an accounting standpoint or economic standpoint, I should say, because it's an attempt to give people money to the people that need the money without trapping people in a situation where they're dependent on the government subsidies by incentivizing them to have earned income. However, it's quite complex due to that due to that little thing that they're trying to do there. And you end up in situations where being able to report income might be beneficial because the earned income tax credit would be higher, for example. So you have these situations where you might be able to choose if it was an exempt uh, income to possibly include it so that it will increase the earned income tax credit that gets a little bit messy and obviously especially for low income taxpayers which you would think that the tax return would be very easy and tax software hopefully can be helpful in those situations when they come up so then on lines 8s i uh, enter the total amount of the non-taxable payments reported on form 1040 or 1040 sr line 1a or 1d in the entry space 
in the pre-printed parentheses as a negative number. So for more information about these payments, you can see publication 525. Line 8T, pension or annuity from a non-qualified deferred compensation plan or a non-governmental section 457 plan. Enter the amount that you've received as a pension or annuity from a non-qualified deferred compensation plan or a non-governmental 547 plan. This may be shown in box 11 of form W-2. So this is a usually a fairly straightforward data input point because it's not something you see all the time, but you'll have it on the box 11 of the W-2, which should make it fairly easy to populate into most software which, which hopefully will help guide you in terms of the population on the tax return. So if you receive such an amount, but box 11 is blank, contact your employer or the payer for the amount received. So line 8U, wages earned while uh, incarcerated. So enter the amount that you received for services performed while an inmate in a penal institution. So I have, hopefully you don't have, you know, a lot of situations where that comes up, but if you do, 8U uh, is where it goes. So, and, and you may receive form or forms W-2 or forms 1099 for that. So you got line 8Z, other income. Use line 8Z to report any taxable income not reported elsewhere on your return or other schedules. List the type and amount of income. If necessary, include a statement showing the required information. For more details, you can see miscellaneous income, which is on publication 525. You can find it at the IRS website, irs.gov tip. If you received a form 1099K for a personal item that you sold at a gain, don't report this amount on line 8Z. Instead, report it as you would report any other capital gain on form 8949 and Schedule D. In other words, the IRS is trying to crack down. Remember how the, this kind of works with the IRS. It's an income tax system. They're going to try to force the payer in any business transaction to, to kind of rat out or tell the income that they reported to the payee. The IRS has the leverage on the payer typically because they're the ones that have a tax benefit, an expense or deduction to, to, to tell them, the IRS, about the one that received. Now, remember that in gig work, it's kind of an issue for the IRS because now you've got people that are doing their own businesses with this new Silk Road, which is the internet and these gig, these gig work platforms connecting people. So now you've got the IRS is losing some control where a lot of people don't have this big corporation that they work for anymore for their entire life, but they're doing their own business connecting with the, with the platforms of these gig works. So the IRS, of course, wants more control so they're trying to get more 1099 k's out there possibly uh forcing the platforms themselves the ubers and that kind of stuff the gig work platforms or the payers of the platforms to be issuing that being the paypals and the credit card companies the banks to issue the 1099 k's and so it could be possible that you get a, a 1099k that's not like your business income but maybe it was like a schedule d type of thing that you sold and you got a 1099k for it obviously you have to report an amount equal or above the 1099k or else the irs will probably uh, come at you because they have the 1099k on their side so if it's a Schedule D capital gain situation, then you could report it on the Schedule D. If it was a Schedule C income on the Schedule C, if the 1099K is just incorrect because it was actually you know, a personal transaction or of some kind, a gift or something, then you have to go to the issuer of this 1099K and try to get them to fix it so that they could send that to the IRS so that you don't end up in a situation where you're reporting something lower than the income reported on the form uh, 1099. If you can't do that, then you can report the proper amount. And if it's lower than the amount on the 1099, you're probably gonna have to deal with the IRS and try to explain the situation and that could delay refunds and whatnot. So examples of income to report on line 8Z include the following. Reimbursements of other amounts received for items deducted in an earlier year, such as medical expenses, real estate taxes, general sales taxes, and home mortgage interest. See uh, uh, recoveries in publication 525 for details on how to figure the amount to report. So this is kind of similar to the, to the state tax situation 
where we said that you might have to include it in income if you got a benefit in the prior year by de deducting the state taxes, which were now refunded to you. You would think, okay, how do I deal with that? If I got a benefit last year for paying something and then they refunded it to me this year, the options would be, you would think to rectify that situation, amend last year's tax return so that you lower the deduction that you got to the amount that wasn't refunded to you or the easier thing to do, include the amount that you got refunded in the current year. So you got kind of similar situations here where you got these reimbursements of other amounts received for items uh, items deducted in the prior year. These are less common kind of situations than the, the state tax, but a similar concept. So reemployment trade adjustment assistance, that's the RTAA payments. These payments should be shown in box five of form 1099G. So if you're in that situation, you should get the 1099G and that should prompt you and you just gotta find the proper location, the data input form 8Z uh, line on schedule one. So loss on certain uh, corrective distributions of excess deferrals. So you can see the retirement plan contribution in publication 525, if that is applicable. Dividends on insurance policies, if they exceed the total of all net premiums you paid for the contract. Uh, recapture of charitable contribution deduction relating to the contribution of fractional interest in tangible personal property. See fractional interest in tangible personal property in publication 526. So that should be an unusual one, but if you have that, you can take a look at that publication. Interest and an additional 10% tax apply to the amount of the recapture. So uh, see instructions for schedule two, line 17G. Recapture of a charitable contribution deduction if the charitable organization disposes of the donated property within three years of the contribution. So again, you should, probably won't see that one uh, too often, but there, it's, it has to do with some complications with regards to benefits on distributions to the charitable contributions. So I won't get into more detail on that now. Taxable part of disaster relief payments. See publication 525 to figure the taxable part, uh, if any. If any of your disaster relief payment is taxable, attach a statement showing the total payment re uh, received and how you figured the taxable part of it. So you can go to publication 525 if you got more detail on that, if you need to dive into that. Taxable distributions from a Coverdale Education Savings Account. ESA or a qualified tuition program, a QTP, distributions from these accounts may be taxable if A, uh, in the case of distributions from a QTP, they are more than the qualified higher education expenses of the designated beneficiary in 2022, or in the case of distributions from an ESA, they are more than the qualified education expenses of the designated beneficiary in 2022, and B, they were not included in a qualified rollover. So you have a similar situation that we saw like with the with the ABLE account and with the and with the uh, like a Roth IRA situation where the benefit of putting the money into these types of accounts is that you get a tax benefit on the growth uh, of them. So if they increase in dividends, interest, capital gains. Suddenly I have an opinion about the capital gains tax. Then possibly you don't have to pay on that if you use the money when you take the money out for the reasons that the government is trying to get you to spend the money on. So I'll, obviously the first one is an education savings account. So you got to spend the, pro the money in that format or else you're going to possibly have a taxable event and possibly penalties and interest. Or if you roll it over, you got to make sure it's still under the kind of like the threshold of that account and then the qualified tuition program. So that's more tax planning uh, ki kind of situation, typically situations for higher income uh, individuals. So non-taxable distributions from these accounts don't have to be reported on form 1040 or 1040SR. So if everything goes smoothly, and you and then you shouldn't you don't have to report them uh, if they're non-taxable so this includes rollovers and qualified higher education expenses refunded to a student from a qtp that were contributed to a qtp with the same designated beneficiary generally within 60 days after the date of refund you can see publication 970 for more information there caution you may have to pay an additional tax if you received a tax 
taxable distribution from a Coverdale ESA or a QTP, see the instructions for Form uh, 5329, meaning if you use the money that you got a tax benefit for by putting the money in there for something other than what the government gave you the tax benefit for, you might have a taxable event as well as possibly penalties. Non-taxable income. Don't report any non-taxable income on line 8Z. Examples of non-taxable income include the following. Child support. So we talked about that in a bit when we talked about like the alimony and child support. So so the, the alimony, remember with these divorce agreements, like they kind of changed it. So if the divorce agreement was after the cutoff date, then both alimony and child support generally are not included in tax for the recipient or deductible for the payer but if you had those situations before the cutoff date then the child support isn't going to be taxable to the recipient or deductible for the payer but the alimony could be and then we so so you might feel like i got child support i have to include that somewhere you don't typically because it's not a taxable it's excluded so this is the definition remember the irs says everything's income unless there's an exception that we give that's an excluded item typically so payments you receive to help you pay your mortgage loan under the hfa hardest hit fund or the homeowner assistance fund so now again you've got money but obviously that was for a program designed to help lower lower income individuals so they they're saying it's exempt so any pay for performance success payments success payments that reduce the principal balance of your home mortgage under the home affordable modification program uh, life insurance proceeds received because someone's death other than from certain employer owned life insurance contracts that's one that comes up fairly often if you have these life insurance policies it comes up when they make the policy and it comes up uh, when someone possibly uh, is getting money from a life insurance policy. You would think maybe that would be a, an income kind of situation, but most of the time it's not unless unless you're in like a, a business kind of, it's like the business kind of situation would be a little bit different. But most of the time the life insurance is set up to benefit uh, the, the, the spouse. Oftentimes, if there was a death of the primary wage earner, and the money when the spouse gets it from the life insurance isn't usually uh, a taxable event, which is good. So gifts and bequests. However, if you received a gift or bequest from a foreign person, including amounts from foreign corporations and foreign partnerships uh, that you treated as gifts, totaling more than 17,339, you may have to report information about it on form 3520 part four, see the instructions uh, for form 3520. So remember that most of the time, if there's a biz, people receive money, that it's a business transaction of some type, unless it's a gift, which typically would be in a family kind of situation, gifting money from a uh, parent to child or something like that. Now, in the gifting situation, you still could have stuff you got to worry about with regards to taxes, and that would be possibly the, the death tax or the estate tax, as it's uh, called. The estate tax being uh, when you die, they might compile all of your assets together. And if you have a substantial amount of assets and the amount of assets, although fairly substantial, does fluctuate up and down a lot. And it used to be one of those taxes where it's like they didn't want to apply it to anyone unless they were re really rich like you would think like billionaires right now but like all taxes the threshold tends to go down to, until it hits like day-to-day -day, uh in you know normal individuals more often right so the so but the, the the amount that could be subject to an estate tax uh fluctuates uh a, a lot and it could fluctuate from administration to administration quite uh, drastically depending on the new laws that are put in place at any given time. Now, obviously, if someone puts in a, a death tax, meaning they're gonna, when you die, the, the government comes in and you know picks your corpse and whatnot, you're gonna try to give away your money before you die. That would be the typical strategy, most likely to your relatives. So then in order to stop that, if they wanna hit you with an estate tax when you die, they're gonna try to limit you from gifting money. So now you've got these gift reporting requirements that are tied to the estate or death tax trying to stop people from giving their money away 
before they die and that's and that's what that is so you can take a look at that it's a quite interesting area in and of its <laughs> in and of itself so in any case you got the form 1099k loss reporting if you sold personal item at a loss other report the loss on form 8949 uh, or report it on line 8z if you report the line on 8z enter the amount of the sale proceeds from form 1099k on line 8z so in the entry space next to line 8z write form 1099k personal item sold at a loss and also enter the amount of the sales proceeds so you have a similar kind of of calculation that you might see on like a, a schedule d type of situation because now you got this 1099 but you're saying it's a personal item that was sold so you want to be able to show the amount of the 1099 and and uh and the gain on it in essence for example you bought a couch for a thousand dollars and sold it through a third party vendor for seven hundred dollars which was reported on your form 1099k and the entry space next to line 8z you would write form 1099k personal item sold at a loss of seven hundred dollars so you can see the instructions uh for line 24 z tip if you sold more than one personal item at a loss or received more than one form 1099k for personal items you sold at a loss in the entry space next to line 8z right forms 1099k personal items sold at a loss and enter the total amount of the sale proceeds on line 8z incorrect form 1099k so we talked about this a little bit what if they gave you a wrong 1099k that causes a problem because the irs has a copy of it and they're going to want you to report something on your tax return that matches the 1099k but the 1099k is wrong because the issuer messed up because it was like a gift or something so if that happens if you receive a form 1099k that shows payments you didn't receive or is otherwise incorrect and you can't get it corrected enter the amount from form 1099k that was incorrectly reported to you on line 8z in the entry space next to line 8z write incorrect form 1099k and also enter the amount that was incorrectly reported to you notice when you get an incorrect 1099k of any kind the first thing you might do is go to the issuer of the 1099 uh, or 1099 of any kind to see if they can correct that to get it to the irs so the irs has the proper amount or has the corrected amount in, on their end note once again with this technique the approach is i need to report something on my return to match the 1099 and i'm going to try to tell the irs look this 1099 was wrong in such a way that it's not going to trigger an automatic kind of delay of the refund or or kind of correction item by not reporting an amount that's on a 1099 so now you've got this technique again where you've got the incorrect amount and then you then you fixed it so for example if you received a form 1099k that incorrectly showed 800 dollars of payment to you you would enter 800 dollars on line 8z and in the entry space next to line 8z you would write incorrect form 1099k negative 800 bringing it back down to zero why do i need to do that when it comes out to zero because you need to show that 800 dollars that ties out to the form 1099k so the irs will will be able to tie that out to their 1099k they got on their side so you can see the instructions for line 24z for more information there